keep calm and carry on. It's a catchphrase that originally appeared on a World War II era British public safety poster. Then it was the turn of the millennium when one of the original posters from that era was found, it was recovered, and then it was hung in a British bookshop. And since then, well, this inspirational message has been reprinted and even reimagined and reproduced into t-shirts and coffee cups and, and all sorts of fun digital memes. For example, one of these memes encourages us to keep calm and grow a mustache. And I take issue with that because I can't stand mustaches. I don't know that I could keep calm and grow a mustache. But another one that I personally like says, keep calm and eat a cupcake. And I can get fully on board with that one. One of my personal favorites directs us to keep calm and call Batman. Unfortunately, when I tried this, Ben Affleck showed up at my house and I, I thought this guy would never leave, and it was just annoying. And finally, I just had to say, Ben Affleck, you need to leave my house. You're the worst Batman ever. Now, as we consider this popular advice, which encourages us to keep calm at all costs, I'm certain that we would all agree that this would be easier said than done. Because the fact is, life quickly spins out of control. And as life quickly spins out of control, it seems like every time we turn around, there's some new tough trial or there's some other tragedy which would keep us from keeping calm. That being the case, we're going to need something more powerful than a silly slogan on an internet meme to help keep us calm. Thankfully, the Christian, well, the Christian is able to keep calm by simply choosing to trust the Lord. And listen, the reason that every Christian can keep calm by trusting in the Lord is based on the fact that the Lord is the one who is able to help us to endure every trial, and the Lord is the one who is able to help us through every tragedy that we face. So as we make our way through our text today, we're going to learn, first of all, that we can keep calm and trust the Lord because he is able to provide refuge for the afflicted. Secondly, this morning we'll learn that we can keep calm and trust the Lord because he is able to provide rewards for the wearied. And finally, today we'll learn that we can keep calm and trust the Lord because he is able to provide rest for the distressed. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 45 because here we find Jeremiah. He's encouraging his buddy Baruch to keep calm and trust the Lord. As you make your way to Jeremiah 45, I want to set the stage for our text today by first reminding you that this man named Baruch was an assistant of Jeremiah. And according to the Jewish historian whose name was Josephus, Baruch was a Jewish aristocrat who served as a chamberlain of King Zedekiah. Not only that, but he also became the scribe who served the prophet Jeremiah. And as a result, he had the honor of writing down the first and the second editions of Jeremiah's prophecies as they had been dictated to him. He was not only the scribe who penned Jeremiah's prophecies, but he, he was also faithful to the teachings of Jeremiah. And for this reason, he became a man who was accused of treason. I'll remind you, it was in Jeremiah chapter 43, where we learned about the day when Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the proud men of Judah, they ended up accusing Baruch of turning Jeremiah against the people of God. Not only that, but they also accused him of attempting to deliver the remnant of Judah into the hands of the Chaldeans so that they might be carried away as captives into Babylon. Thankfully for him, the Lord had already prepared his heart to understand that these attacks were coming and that he had the strength that he needed in the Lord to endure all of these personal attacks. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at Jeremiah chapter 45, we're going to begin reading at verse 1, because there we read the word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch the son of Neriah when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow, 
I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what have I built? Uh, what, I, what I have built I will break down, and what I have planted I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. Now here in our text today, we're taken back in time to the events which were recorded back in Jeremiah chapter 36. It'll help us to remember that it was back there in Jeremiah 36 where we learned about that day when Jeremiah came to Baruch and directed him to take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words of the prophecies that he had received up until that point in time. After the scroll was completed, Jeremiah then sent Baruch to the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And there at the temple, Baruch was instructed to read every prophecy that was recorded in that first edition in the hearing of all the people of Judah. As he did, well, it was shortly thereafter where King Jehoiakim became so entirely enraged with Baruch and with Jeremiah that he actually made them the most wanted men in all of Judah. Well, now here we are in our text today, and Jeremiah is now presenting us with what happened after Baruch discovered that he had become one of the most hated men in all of Judah. We're presented with Baruch's response to his plummeting popularity. And if you would notice with me again there in verse 3, because there we learn that Baruch ended up declaring, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing and I find no rest. From this we can see that Baruch was already filled with sorrow. He, he, he was filled with sorrow as he considered the punishment that was about to come upon his people. He had heard the prophecies of Jeremiah. He had written them down in a book. He had presented them to the people of Judah, and, and he was filled with sorrow as he realized what was about to come upon his people. Then on top of that, he felt like the Lord was adding grief to his sorrow as he began to realize that the leaders of Judah were now wanting to punish him simply because he set out to serve the Lord as the scribe of Jeremiah. Now I should point out that the word grief that's found there in verse 3 is translated from a Hebrew word which speaks of the anguish and the agony that occurs whenever a person finds themselves afflicted with the sorrows of this world. And so you find yourself and, and, and you're dealing with tragedies and trials and, and turmoil and, and you're filled with sorrow as a result. And then the grief that comes along after that when even more trouble comes into your life. That's what's happening here in the life of Baruch. And as we consider this definition of, of this word grief, it seems obvious to me that Baruch was a man whose compounding sorrows resulted in the affliction of this great grief as he began to realize that not only was his country about to be destroyed by these Babylonians, but the king of Judah, well, he was now preparing to punish Baruch for simply serving the Lord. That being the case, he couldn't help but to feel like the Lord was the one who was afflicting him by adding grief to his sorrow. And so he even cries out and accuses the Lord of being the one who has added grief to his sorrow. It's, it's as if he's saying, hey, Lord, I, I set out to serve you. And now you're going to repay me by adding grief to my sorrow? Well, rather than allowing Baruch to sit there and suffer in his sorrow, the Lord led Jeremiah to go and encourage the heart of this sorrowful, sorrowful servant, servant by helping him to understand that, that he just simply needed to keep calm and trust the Lord. But this is our focus. I'd like you to look with me again there at this prophetic promise that the Lord presented through the prophet Jeremiah. So notice with me again there in the middle of verse 4, because there the Lord first confirmed this coming catastrophe but by declaring this. He says, Behold, what I have built, I will break down. And what I have planted, I will pluck up, that is, this whole land. In other words, the Lord's saying, hey, I have a plan here to punish my people. And though I built this nation... It's my prerogative, it's my plan if I want to destroy them if they're refusing to repent. Though I planted these people here in this promised land, well, I can pluck them up if I so choose, if, if that's what they need in order to correct their course of life. He's letting Baruch know that don't, don't, don't be upset with me 
because these people refuse to repent. Don't be mad at me because I'm doing what's right in punishing these people. The Lord's saying, hey, my plans are the right plans, and you need to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Unfortunately for Baruch, well, he had other plans that really weren't in line with the punishment of his people. He had other plans regarding his own future there in his homeland of Judah. And his desires, well, they seem to have included a personal plan to become rich and powerful there in his homeland. In order to prove my point, notice with me again there in verse 5, because there the Lord declares, do you seek great things for yourself? Now, this is a rhetorical question. The Lord knows what's in the heart of men. The Lord knows what we want. The Lord knows what we desire. The Lord certainly knew what Baruch was thinking. He knew about Baruch's plans for his own life. And so he's rhetorically asking, do you seek great things for yourself? And the answer, of course, was yes. This was a man who was seeking great things for himself. He wanted to be a man of position and power and prestige. So he says, do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh says the Lord. Now, in order to further prove my point that this was a man who was seeking great things for himself, it'll help us to understand that the Hebrew word translated great things here in this, in this verse, it was used in reference to those things that were powerful or those people who were prestigious. That being the case, we're led to assume here that the great grief of Baruch's afflictions, well, they were large, largely based on his quickly disappearing dreams. In other words, the affliction of Baruch's sorrowful grief seems to have been amplified by the fact that his dreams of becoming a powerful and prestigious man, they were quickly dissolved before his very eyes, especially as he realized that his people would soon become the slaves of the Chaldeans. You see, how can you become a great person when you've become one of the many slaves of these people who are being punished? As he realized that God was about to turn all of his people into the slaves of the Chaldeans, his dreams of becoming a powerful man there in Judah were just disappearing like a vapor of smoke. Knowing what was about to happen to his people, Baruch set out to change the course of history. He wanted to help his people to understand their need to repent, and so he went out as the scribe of Jeremiah and was ready to present the people with the warnings of God. But they wouldn't listen. They weren't willing to repent. Baruch, well, he not only went out and warned these people and then was quickly rejected, but listen, he, in his attempt to serve the Lord, ended up becoming the second most wanted religious extremist in Judah. And just like that, his dreams of becoming this powerful, prestigious man Vanished away. Just like our dreams when we wake up. They're just gone. Thankfully for Baruch here, though, God had a plan to provide this grief-filled, afflicted man with a place of perfect refuge. However, he would need to first set aside his own personal plans for acquiring his power and prestige. In other words, he needed to recognize that his plans were the wrong plans and the the Lord's plans were the right plans. As a matter of fact, look with me there again at verse 5 because there the Lord asks, Do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. In other words, the Lord was promising to provide Baruch with the perfect protection of of this incredible refuge. The Lord was saying, hey, I'll become your refuge if you'll set aside your plan to become rich and powerful. If he would simply give up his own desire for greatness and submit to the the, the, the perfect will of God, then Baruch could believe that there would be refuge in the midst of his afflictions. From this, it's important for us to understand that many of our afflictions occur whenever our dreams and desires are denied. We can even find ourselves growing frustrated with with those who may have gotten in the way uh, of our dreams. We have plans for our life. We have 
uh, somewhere that we want to go. We, we have something that we want to become. And, and if somebody gets in the way of that, well, we, we become very mad at them. We can feel like they're afflicting us by keeping us from accomplishing what we really want to accomplish. And, and you know, oftentimes that becomes the Lord. We feel like the Lord is the one who is keeping us from fulfilling our dreams. Oftentimes we feel like the Lord is the one who is adding grief to our sorrow because uh, we end up facing those unexpected difficulties that we think, well, the Lord could have stopped this. The, the Lord could have kept this all from happening, and because he didn't, he's the one who is ruining my dreams of future greatness. Rather than keeping calm and trusting in God's sovereign will, well, there's too many times when we sit around grumbling and complaining about all of the afflictions that have ruined our lives. And knowing that we all struggle with this issue, I think it would be important for us to consider Paul's example and how he dealt with this. And so if you would, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Hold your place here in the book of Jeremiah. We'll be back to Jeremiah 45. Turn with me, though, to 2 Corinthians 12, because there we find Paul. He's recounting the way in which the Lord was allowing him to suffer all these different afflictions so that he might learn how to keep calm and trust in the Lord by seeking the protection of refuge that's found in the Lord's grace. And as we consider his example, I hope that we'll learn how to follow in Paul's footsteps by realizing that God will also allow afflictions into our lives so that we might learn how to keep calm and trust him and find that place of refuge in his grace. Now, with this is our focus. If you would look with me there at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to begin reading at verse 7. There Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, or in other words, concerning this thorn in the flesh, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness, therefore most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here in these verses we find Paul, he's actually rejoicing over the fact that the Lord's grace had become sufficient for him. And though he had suffered from the afflictions of infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, and distresses, Paul learned how to simply keep calm by trusting the Lord. Paul learned how to endure every affliction by seeking the refuge that's found in the grace of God. And while we can be certain that Paul had never planned on going out and facing all of these afflictions. It wasn't like on his daily to-do list. What should I do today? Well, let's go out and cause trouble, you know, as a Christian evangelist. And let's see how many people I can get, you know, chasing me through, you know, these cities and, and trying to kill me. No, this wasn't part of his plan. This wasn't on his to-do list. And yet it came to him all the same. All of these afflictions still came into his life as he set out to serve the Lord. And in all of this, Paul realized he needed to find a place of refuge in the grace of God so that he could continue to move forward and press on and accomplish the Lord's calling. It's in similar fashion that we can be certain that the Lord also desires to provide every born-again believer with the refuge of his grace. The Lord actually wants to become a place of refuge for us, and yet much like Baruch, well, the Lord would tell us, hey, you need to stop trying to be something great here. You need to stop seeking great things for yourself because that's always going to get in the way of learning how to, to seek refuge in the Lord's grace. You see, if we're out here attempting to become great in and of ourselves, if we're seeking great things for ourselves, then we're typically walking in a way that's different than the Lord's plan for our life. 
And I'm here to tell you that the Lord has already promised to bring adversity on all flesh on this planet. That day is coming, maybe sooner than we'd even like to think. And yet if we would learn how to just find refuge in the Lord's grace, then, then we can say, okay. I realize that the Lord has his plan, and I might not be completely thrilled about that plan, but at least I can sit in the protection of the Lord's grace and be a part of his plan. What this takes is a believer who's willing to say, you know what, I'm not going to freak out about what's coming on this planet. I'm not going to freak out about all the afflictions of life. I'm not going to freak out every time the Lord doesn't bless my plans. But instead, I'm going to keep calm and trust in the Lord and allow his grace to become my refuge point. We need to, though, set aside our personal plans so that we can enjoy the refuge of his grace. And, and you, listen, this refuge is found wherever we go. And regardless of the afflictions that come upon us, the refuge of the Lord's grace is always here for us. And so if you're afflicted with sorrowful grief here this morning, I just encourage you, keep calm. Trust the Lord and allow his grace to become your refuge. And listen, the Lord not only provides refuge for the afflicted, but he's also going to provide rewards for the wearied. And with this as our focus, let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 45. And I want to continue to consider the woeful heart of this man named Baruch. If you would look with me, we're going to begin reading again there at verse 3, because there Baruch says, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. And then he says this, I fainted in my sighing. Here in this verse, we learn that Baruch was not only struggling with the afflictions of this grief that was added to his sorrow, but then we also see that he was a man who was wearied to the point of exhaustion, and, and he was a man who was ready to throw in the towel. In order to prove my point, it'll help us to understand that the word fainted found there in verse 3, it's translated from a Hebrew word which was used to refer to the person who had become completely worn out with wearisome work. Based on this definition, this is why the scholars of the New International Version translated the verse in this way. They put it like this. Woe to me, the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am worn out with groaning. Now from this we can see that Baruch was worn out by the laborious task of helping Jeremiah to write down all these prophecies and, and, and present these prophecies to his unrepentant kinsmen. He was wearied by all of the distressing disappointments that arose because of his unrepentant kinsmen. I'm guessing that maybe many of us here this morning kind of feel this pain because as we find ourselves today in Jeremiah chapter 45, we have to admit that this has been a hard book to study through. How many different ways can we read the story that the people of God were sinning, God rebuked them, they wouldn't repent, and so God punished them. It can be wearisome to make our way through this book, but now feel Baruch's pain here, because he was there, uh, you know, before all of this went down. We're looking at it, you know, in hindsight, and just going, man, this is a wearisome book to make our way through. But Baruch was there before this all went down. He's there with prophecies in hand saying, hey guys, this is about to happen to us. Repent. And the people saying, eh, forget about it. We're going to do our own thing. Can you imagine how worn out he was weeping over his people and warning his people and attempting to lead them to a place of repentance so that they might not be destroyed? as we consider the way in which he was called to catalog and record all of these prophecies which were presented through Jeremiah, Baruch became a man who began to realize that it wasn't long until his carnal kinsmen would be punished and he would lose everything as his homeland was destroyed by the Chaldeans. So he was worn out. He had become a man who was worn out by the grief of, of many groanings. I can imagine that each time he's writing down these prophecies, he's just, he's just groaning. 
because he realizes what's going to happen to his people. Well, thankfully for Baruch, the Lord wanted this faithful servant to receive rewards for all of his troubles. And though he was worn out and wearied by serving the Lord, the Lord wanted him to know that rewards were on the way. As a matter of fact, notice with me again there in the middle of verse 5, because there the Lord declares, I will give your life to you as a prize. Now, the word prize here was translated from a Hebrew word, which was used to refer to the spoils of war. Not only that, but it was also used in reference to the treasures that were taken and the rewards that were claimed by a warrior who was victorious in battle. In this case, the reward that the Lord was presenting to Baruch was the prize of his life. In other words, the Lord was promising to protect Baruch through the battles of the Babylonian invasions, and he was promising to protect him uh, everywhere else that he went. As a matter of fact, notice with me again there in the middle of verse 5 where the Lord declares, I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. Or more simply put, Baruch's life would be his reward there in Judah, or, or if he was hauled off to Babylon, or I'll remind you, as of the last couple of chapters, we learned that Baruch was actually carried away to Egypt. And the Lord had promised to destroy all those people who set their sights on Egypt as a place to seek refuge. And yet here, it seems like this chapter, which is chronologically out of order, it seems to have been placed right here because Jeremiah may have been reminding Baruch about the promise that God made so many chapters before and so many years before, when the Lord promised that his life would be his prize, no matter where he went. And so that was true of Baruch's life there in Egypt. His life would be a prize to him. Baruch's life would be his reward wherever he went. And listen, it's in similar fashion that the servant who has placed their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is also going to be rewarded from the wearisome troubles that we've suffered as we've set out to serve the Lord, we're going to be rewarded with the prize of our life. One example which will help us to grasp this wonderful truth is based on Paul's account of Moses' decision to stand with God's chosen people. And with this is our focus, hold your place here in the book of Jeremiah and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. As you make your way to Hebrews 11, it's interesting to note that Bible teachers commonly refer to this chapter as the Hall of Faith. The reason why is due to the fact that this chapter highlights the incredible acts of faith which were accomplished by these Old Testament saints who truly trusted in the Lord. And without debate, Moses was one of those faithful saints who understood that it would be better to suffer for Christ in this world and receive everlasting rewards in the afterlife. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Hebrews 11, I want to begin reading at verse 24, because there Paul writes, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches... Than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Here in these verses we find Moses, he's demonstrating what it means to keep calm and trust in the Lord. You see, Moses was a man who had everything offered to him on a silver platter. He was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, and, and so he had position, he had power, he had prestige, and yet he chose to give it all up. He gave up the passing pleasure of sin so that he could stand with the people of God. He gave up the passing pleasure of sin so that he could serve the true and living God. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ. He esteemed the reproach of the Messiah as being greater riches. In other words, it was more valuable to suffer for the Messiah than to receive all the treasures of Egypt. He understood how to keep calm and trust in God because he was focused on the reward that he would receive on the day of his salvation. 
He was willing to suffer the afflictions of this world to enjoy the everlasting rewards that would be given by our everlasting Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we need to focus on, Christian. Not the passing pleasures of this world's treasures, but the rewards that we will will receive when we stand before our Savior. And in order to further grasp this truth, continue holding your place there in the book of Jeremiah and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. As you make your way to 1 Peter 1, I want to take a moment to point out that the person who truly trusts in the Lord, we're going to be given the power that we need to endure every affliction as we hang out in that protective refuge of God's grace. But not only that, not only will we we receive that power that we need to endure the afflictions of this world, but much like Baruch, we're also going to receive our life as a prize on the day when the Lord rewards every believer with our eternal inheritance. And this is precisely what Peter was talking about here in 1 Peter chapter 1. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me, beginning at verse 3, there Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Note this, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now here in these verses we find Peter, he's writing about the way in which the Lord has provided every believer with our life, as a prize. And though we may find ourselves here in this world being grieved by by various trials and all sorts of troubles and tribulations, I want you to know that there's coming a day when every Christian is going to receive the eternal reward of an incorruptible inheritance which will cause us to rejoice with inexpressible joy. It's so joyful that that Paul refers, or Peter refers to this as inexpressible joy. And, and maybe when we get to heaven, we'll be able to express it there. But at least here on earth, Peter's saying, hey, I, I'd like to tell you how joyful this is, but it's inexpressible joy. How incredible is that? There's coming a day, believer, when those who were wearied and worn out by serving the Lord here on this planet, we will find ourselves so filled with inexpressible joy as we receive the incorruptible inheritance of everlasting life. And so if you're worn out from groaning, if you feel spent and wearied and you don't know how to press on, I just encourage you to keep calm and continue trusting in the Lord. Focus on the reward that the Lord has waiting for you in heaven. And in order to further grasp what I'm saying, consider what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3 when he declared this. He says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. In other words, Paul was encouraging us to continue serving the Lord Jesus Christ, even if we're completely worn out. And maybe that describes some of the servants in this church right now. You just feel completely worn out. You don't have anything left to spend. You're just exhausted, and you don't know how to keep going. And it just seems like every time you take a step forward to serve the Lord, more trouble comes into your life, and more grief comes into your life, and there's more affliction in your life, and you're just ready to throw in the towel like Baruch. And yet Paul's saying, hey, just remember, You're going to receive the reward of inheritance if you continue serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If 
you're ready to give up, if you're worn out from groaning, I just encourage you, keep your focus on the reward. Because there's coming a day when we'll stand in the presence of our Savior and we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And at that point in time, the, the things that seemed like such big issues here in this world will just be like, I don't even know if we'll remember them. What we think is so tough today and, and, and the trials and tribulations that are just wearing us out today, when we cross over, they will have been nothing in comparison to the glory that's waiting for us. There's an eternal weight of glory that's waiting for us on the other side. And so I encourage you, keep calm in the midst of every trial. Keep calm in the midst of every affliction. And trust the Lord who is waiting to reward us with inexpressible, everlasting joy. Keep calm and continue trusting the Lord because he's going to reward every wearied believer. And listen, not only will the Lord provide refuge for the afflicted, and not only will he provide rewards for the wearied, but he's also going to provide rest for the distressed. And with this as our focus, let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 45, and I want to continue to consider the woeful heart of this man named Baruch. If you would look with me again there at verse 3, there Baruch says, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing. And then he says this, I find no rest. Here in this verse, we find Baruch struggling with the fact that his trials and troubles had resulted in many sleepless nights. And it will help us to understand that that word rest found here in this verse, it's translated from a Hebrew word which was used to refer to the quiet comfort of a still resting place. In light of this definition, it seems clear to me here that Baruch was struggling to find a quiet, comfortable place to rest. Those of you who have young kids probably understand Baruch's problem here can be hard to find a quiet, comfortable place of rest when you have kids bouncing off the walls and running around the house. And we've got a couple of kids that live next door to us, and they're always outside playing football and yelling and screaming. And we've got neighbors on the other side who I think they are, are, have entered a competition to make the most noise in Austin, Texas. And uh, I think they're going to get a trophy soon. But uh, it can at times be hard to find a quiet, comfortable place of rest. That being the case, I'm going to guess here that Baruch had become this person who just needed a good night of sleep and just couldn't find that place of rest. Remember, he had become an outcast in Judah. Everyone probably hated him except Jeremiah. I'm going to guess that as the, 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 the whole remnant of Judah ended up hating Jeremiah that, or, and Baruch here, that, that even their closest family turned on them. And maybe he lived with some family, and, and maybe uh, he had to sleep with one eye open because he was worried about what might happen to him if he fully went to sleep. Not only that, but I'm going to also guess here that Baruch was having trouble sleeping simply because the grief that he was suffering from, the, the afflictions that he was enduring, I, I'm going to guess that, that these things followed him to bed. You know, your mind can kind of be plagued with these things that are causing you affliction. And I'm sure we've all had those issues that, that keep us from enjoying a good night of sleep. Maybe it's financial problems, or maybe it's relational complications, or, or maybe it's work-related issues, or, or maybe you're a student who just puts off studying to the last minute, and so you toss and turn at night because you know you're not ready to take that, that test. But regardless of the exact nature of the trials that we've personally experienced, I'm certain that we've all had those troubles that follow us to bed. As a result, I'm sure that we've all ended up tossing and turning all night long, and, and just when you think you, you've finally gotten to, to, to sleep, your eyes are just wide open as the mind replays these afflictions and these problems, and it's 3 a.m., and you need to get to sleep, and you can't. 
I'm guessing this is what was going on in Baruch's life. He was having a hard time sleeping because of all the trials that he was facing. And thankfully for him, well, the Lord sent Jeremiah to encourage him to keep calm and trust the Lord so that he could, in fact, enjoy the rest that comes when you have perfect peace in your heart. With this in mind, look with me again there at the end of verse 5, because there the Lord directs Jeremiah to declare, I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. In other words, the Lord was assuring Baruch here that he was living under the sovereign protection of the Lord no matter where he went and regardless of what time of day it was. What that means is that Baruch could just set those things aside and say, it's time for bed, I don't have to think about this anymore. Lord, help me to turn my brain off here and get a good night's sleep. Baruch could clearly keep calm and trust the Lord to protect him even as he slept because the Lord is saying, hey, I'm going to give your life to you as a prize wherever you go, even when you go and, and, and lay down and go to bed. Now it's possible that you've been losing some sleep over sorrowful afflictions that are just way beyond your control, and yet your mind wants to try to control it, and so you lay there and you toss and turn. And if so, then you can probably relate with Baruch when he declared, Woe is me, for the Lord has added grief to my, my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Maybe that's what you were saying last night at 3 a.m. as you were trying to get, to get to sleep. You know, whenever... Whenever I struggle like that myself, you know, trying to get to sleep, and I just, I'm just tossing and turning. What I do is I just turn on a, a Bible study by Pastor Dennis Norman uh, there in Bastrop, and it just puts me right to bed. Just, just try it sometime. But seriously, if this sounds like you, then I, I, want, I want to help you to realize that the Lord is able to provide rest for the distressed. He is. And in order to prove my point, Turn with me to Acts chapter 12, because it's in Acts chapter 12 where we find the Apostle Peter. He's actually sleeping through a very distressful situation. As a matter of fact, here in this text, Peter's not in his bedroom, uh, sleeping on a nice, comfy, tempur bed, you know, just with, 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 the, with the sleep mask on and, and Yanni playing in the background and that sort of thing. No, no, no. Peter's in prison. He's chained to some Roman guards. He's probably on some cold floor. And yet he's fast asleep. With this in mind, look with me there at Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, because there Luke writes, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. Bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he, speaking of the angel, struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Now, here in these verses, we find Peter, he's there in prison, and you know, he had been out serving the Lord and preaching the gospel message, and he'd become an enemy of the state. And, you know, it was a popular thing to do to persecute Christians at this point in time. And so Herod decided that he's going to lock Peter up. And, and, and while the affliction of this persecution might have kept him from enjoying a good night's sleep there in this prison, Peter seems to have had no problem sleeping there between those two Roman soldiers. As a matter of fact, he was sleeping so soundly that the arrival of this angel didn't even wake him up. And, and if you would notice again, there in verse 7, that the angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. Now, I don't know about you, but if you come into the room where I'm sleeping and you turn on a light, I'm up. Doesn't take much. And yet here's Peter and this glorious light from this angelic being is shining in this dark prison cell and that doesn't wake peter up and so the angel's like all right gotta step it up a little bit you know i tried the whole angelic light thing and that didn't work 
So he strikes him on the side. Now, that's not very angelic, you know, but, but there he is. He strikes him on the side. He gave him a little whack, you know, on the side, and, and that didn't work. And so what does he do next? He raises Peter up. He, he literally takes Peter and picks him up and puts him on his feet. And if you continue reading on, you'll learn that Peter didn't actually come to, uh, you know, for several blocks down the road. That's how deeply he was sleeping there in that Roman prison. The light didn't get him up. The strike on the side didn't get him up. He was even raised to his feet, and he kind of came to, but he was probably just kind of like, not now, Mom, I'm having a good dream. He was sleeping soundly. And as we consider the way that Peter was able to rest in the midst of this distressful situation, I mean, he's in prison. He's about to be brought out, put on trial, possibly be put to death, and yet he's not tossing and turning. He's not worrying. He's keeping calm and trusting the Lord. With this, I'm reminded of something that Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 3 when he described the rest of those who truly trust the Lord. He, he says this, When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. Christian, listen, if you find yourself distressed over some grievous situation in your life, Keep calm and trust in the Lord. Because listen, those who will simply trust in the Lord will also be able to rest in the midst of every distressing situation. Now, in order to further grasp the reality of this truth, turn with me to the 37th Psalm. And as you turn to Psalms chapter 37, I want to take a moment to remind you that the Lord has promised to work all things together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. What this means is that God has the sovereign ability to take every affliction that we experience, every affliction that would cause us to suffer many sleepless nights, he can take those afflictions, he can take those tragedies and trials, and he can work them out for the good of those who love him. That's how big our God is. Now, do you really believe that? If so, then why would a Christian who truly trusts the Lord lose sleep over something that the Lord has promised to work out for our good? I mean, if we really believe that, if we really believe that he will take every single thing and work it out for the good of those who love him and for those who have been called according to his purpose, then we shouldn't lose sleep over anything. This seems to be what King David is writing about here in the 37th Psalm. If you would look with me, beginning at verse 3, because there David declares, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. And then he says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Now, here in these verses, we find King David connecting the concepts of trust and rest. He's connecting these concepts of trust and rest because the person who truly trusts the Lord is the person who's also able to rest, even in times of distress. David is basically letting us know here that those who truly trust in the Lord and those who commit their ways to him will also be able to rest even in the midst of every distressful situation. Therefore, if you've been losing sleep over some distressful situation, then I encourage you to keep calm and trust the Lord because the Lord can provide rest for the distress. Now, I don't know what sort of afflictions you're facing today. Chances are we all are. I don't know what kind of grief you're dealing with today, but I'm going to guess that many of us are grieving over something. I'm going to guess that there are those of us who are wearied and worn out and we're struggling to find rest, we're struggling to get a good night's sleep. Thankfully, the Lord presents us with the best solution in the book of Jeremiah. If you would, let's turn back to the book of Jeremiah. I'd like you, though, to turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. And though we've already covered this chapter several months ago, 
I think it's important for us to reconsider an important truth that we find here in Jeremiah 17. You see, it's here in this text where we find the Lord. He's encouraging the people of Judah to simply trust him. And you know, if they would have followed this advice back in chapter 17, then the Chaldeans would have never come, the Babylonians would have never invaded, and the city of Jerusalem would have never been destroyed. If they would have just trusted the Lord, if they would have just kept calm and trusted the Lord and repented of their sins and committed their ways to him, then they could have avoided everything that happened after Jeremiah 17. Unfortunately, they they didn't receive the encouragement found here in this text. I'm hoping that we all will today. I hope that we'll consider what the Lord is saying here in Jeremiah 17 and commit it to our lives. And with this as our focus, look with me there at Jeremiah 17. We're going to begin reading at verse 5. There Jeremiah writes, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Now here in these verses, we're presented with a contrast between those who trust in humans and those who trust in the Lord. And there's a contrast between these two sorts of people because, listen, those who place their trust in humans, and I'll remind you, you are a human. And so this includes you. If you trust in you, you're going to be cursed. That's not me cursing you. This is the Lord saying this. If you trust in humans, including yourself, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be like a a dried up plant in the desert that has no water and therefore can't bear any fruit. But the person who trusts in the Lord will be blessed. You'll, you'll be, that, be, be like that tree that's planted by water, and there's always enough water to, to, to bear fruit. So with that, I want to conclude our study by encouraging every believer here today, whatever's happening in your life, keep calm and trust the Lord. Keep calm and trust the Lord because this is where the true blessings come from. This is, this is how we bear spiritual fruit Keep calm and trust the Lord because he's able to provide refuge for the afflicted in the midst of his grace. Keep calm and trust the Lord because he's able to provide rewards for the wearied. Keep calm and trust the Lord because he's able to provide rest for the distressed. Keep calm and trust the Lord because the Lord is the one who is truly trustworthy. Trustworthy. 